I'm delighted to have back in the studio David Roberts. He is Head of Fixed Income at Ned Group. Thanks for joining us again, David. Great to be so last time we met, you were about to launch a fund and this year you've launched a fund. Can you tell us a bit about uh, how you've done that and how your year's been so far? Yeah, great. Um, yeah, we, we, as you say, last time we were talking about something in theory and now we have a, you know, something in practice. Um, it's always an interesting uh, experience to go through you know, building something very much from the, the ground up. Um, and I think many fund managers aren't really totally aware of some of the the detail and the admin that has to go into to getting a fund off the ground, uh, and you know I would say um, uh, all due respect to Negro, they've done a fantastic job to to put us in a position where a few months after we joined, we we did have a portfolio to to take to market, um, and yeah, so far so good. Excellent, exciting times, right? So last time we met was November twenty twenty three, and since then we've had a number of rate cuts all across Europe in the, and in the US. Um, has that changed the investment proposition for bonds? I know yields have fallen, not significantly, um, but definitely rates peaked. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's been an interesting few months. Our view very much is we're in this kind of old normal world, which um, never get too sucked into to QE and zero interest rates, rather that we expected interest rates always to be at a level which offered value for our investors. And maybe we could talk about that in a minute or two. Um, and our view really today is little changed from what it was in November, that you really should think about bonds for the long term and not expect maybe 10, 15, 20% returns one year, but rather a fairly steady, uh, um, smooth is a bad word to use, but uh, certainly a smoother pattern uh, of returns than, than some would suggest is uh, likely from the market. Sure. So the bonds still have that function as a sort of volatility dampener in, in portfolio. Yeah, I mean, I think the, the last few months have shown that they can, for short periods of time, exhibit volatility. But exactly as you said, James, if we think of yields today, that certainly in the UK, they're not that different from where they were in November last year. So investors have made, you know, 2 or 3%, pretty much what you would expect really from that core of your portfolio, I think. Sure. So um, in terms of mispriced opportunities, you describe yourself as a value investor. I mean, where, where are you seeing... Uh, you know, I understand what being a value investor would mean for an equity investor, but how, how does a bond investor, how do you search out things that the market haven't quite got right? So, so there's, I guess, two things. The, the first is that when we're building portfolios, we're really talking about for the longer term. So we're taking strategic decisions. And value there is, for us, quite straightforward, that, that we want investors to be rewarded uh, or to be compensated to a greater extent than um, prevailing rates of inflation. So if we think of inflation in the longer term as 2 percent across the G7, then what we really want from core bonds is a minimum of that type of level. So again, coming back to zero interest rates, if inflation's 2%, all you're doing is throwing money away if you're buying bonds or any other asset class with, with the prospect of a zero return. And then in the short term, what we try to do is seek some tactical opportunities where markets maybe get misaligned. Um, a good example of the last few months is that uh, the UK government bond market has actually been about the worst performing of the major markets uh, that the, certainly that we look to invest in. And the question for us as we approach the budget is, is now a good time to increase the weighting there? Or is the, the underperformance just a sign of more uh, more difficult times for the gold market to come? Sure, yeah. We'll pick up on the budget in a couple of minutes. But I mean, you describe yourself you know, as so your key principles are quality and liquidity. As yields fall, do you need to look at less liquid and bonds below investment grade? Or is there enough within the quality space that you don't need to look elsewhere? Um, we, we would say the, the latter. There's generally enough within that quality space. You know, we can play globally. So again, I mentioned the gilt market. It's um, a tiny percentage, well under 10% of, our, of the market that we look at. And generally, you can find relative value opportunities. So when the the overall yield, the beta, if you like, of the market um, falls, then quite often that creates alpha opportunities mm -hmm. and the ability to exploit one market versus another. Okay. Um, and there's plenty of examples we could give of those. Sure, right. So um, in the next month, we've got the UK budget and the US election. So how, as a bond investor, do you position your portfolio ahead of that? And how do you also keep the political noise, of which there is a lot, mm -hmm. Uh, separate from the economic arguments for owning, say, US Treasuries? Yeah, so so I guess the, the political noise, I think is a very good way to put it, generally is much more important in the short term than, than the longer term. 
And if we look at the history of most major markets, both bond and equity, we tend to find that there are, there can be a bit of volatility, some price spikes or falls round about political events, and clearly the UK is no stranger to those in recent years. But generally, um, economics reasserts itself in the, the medium to long term. So again, we, we try to look through that noise as much as possible. But to your question, I think, again, we do think about the, the global market. We can, if we so choose, um, pretty much ignore the UK because it's a very small part of our market. But it does still offer us an opportunity. Um, the US, in all honesty, is uh, certainly in the short term, is much more important, much bigger part of the global market. Um, and certainly something that tends still to lead uh, what happens in other jurisdictions. Sure. So we were talking off camera about the um, the potential, if a Trump, uh, Trump were to succeed, whether the deficit would be pushed up and what that would mean for capital flows globally in bond markets. Yeah, I think that's a very good question. I mean, certainly both uh, Trump and Harris are um, fiscal, uh, are fav- favour fiscal stimulus, just um, the Republican Party or certainly under Trump, perhaps to a greater extent. I would say that there's a degree of complacency in markets, and, and certainly we have to be um, conscious of the fact that the US could increase its um, debt burden significantly from here. We're already at a stage where Japan and China are 15 to 20% of the um, listed global bond market. So there are opportunities for international investors to um, look beyond the US, which for most of my career has been quite a difficult thing to do. You know, the US has generally uh, attracted the, the certainly the vast majority of global capital. So the more pressure we see on uh, the US uh, deficit, the, the more threat there is to the US ratings, um, yeah. the greater the possibility. I think we could see some international investors moving to other jurisdictions. Um, that's not intended to scaremongering. It's just rather that that's something that we as uh, investors need to be aware of short term. And that potentially gives us the opportunity uh, to to add some value for our clients exploiting it. Sure. Well, I guess it's best to get ahead of potential problems as the before they suddenly happen. Anyway, so thanks so much for your in- insights, David. Let's let's catch up soon and discuss the the bond markets and maybe after the election. So for Morningstar, I'm James Garner.